Now it is time to move on to group chat and really dig deep on a certain topic. And I think this week is something that Mona, uh, I think you'll have a lot to say about. This is up your alley. Right up your alley. Um, And that is talking about VR and it's sort of used to create a a sense of empathy. And sort of the impetus for this conversation uh, is an article written by one of our editors over in the UK, Aaron, he talks about this game called The Circle. Dana, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so it's it's a game that um, I don't believe is out yet. Right now it's only being demoed at various gaming shows. Um, but Aaron got to play um, a few minutes of it, and it puts you in the first in the uh, in the position of a transgender person who is wheelchair bound after um, being attacked in a hate crime. And um, it is a VR game, and it, um, uh, well, we'll delve into this, obviously, but it, it, um, it definitely helped Aaron um, build not just, not just sympathy, because I think he already sympathized, but I think it, it did effectively put him in this, the, the shoes of this um, fictional person. Yeah. Um. And so I guess, one, of, one of the bigger questions, I guess, you know, there's plenty of games and stuff that aim to put you in the shoes of another person. They can create uh, a sense of empathy or connection mm-hmm. with characters. Um, but Mona, VR is very unique in that way and can be used to create a much more powerful connection with characters, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's... I think for the longest time, VR has been talked about in the context of gaming, and that's great, and that's what sort of kicked it off and brought it mainstream. But I think one of the biggest um, benefits of VR, I think, is this idea, not just idea, but the actual feeling of empathy. When you strap on a headset and sort of instantly get transported to, you know, someone's life or a certain situation, I think that's incredibly powerful. And we've never seen anything anything else like it. Um, I think it makes... From a journalistic point of view, I think it makes news more hard-hitting. Everything, you know, everything right now, you just sort of get drowned and things feel so far removed from where you are. But when you're in VR and watching a journalistic story, I think it instantly puts everything in perspective and makes you feel things that you don't feel from watching it on TV. Um, So, yeah, I think it's one of the most important things about VR. And I'm glad that a lot of people are actually using it for that now. I I think that's one of the first places that... uh started seeing a lot of people talking about VR and its ability to create em- empathy was very much in these sort of news focused things, mm-hmm. right? Uh, New York Times and others have used it in that way? Yeah. Um, I think New York Times by far does a phenomenal job. Some of the um, VR journalistic pieces are really, really interesting to watch. Um, but also the UN, they do such a phenomenal job and they actually recently launched a VR app just sort of dedicated to the VR experiences they're building around the world. Um, and I think UN being the UN, they have such incredible access to people that they bring really powerful stories forward. Um, but I think what I really like about what the UN's doing with it in particular is that, sure, you feel certain things when you watch something, right? And even Aaron's piece, I was reading it this morning, it's incredibly powerful. I was so moved when I was reading that. But for me, what do you do when you feel that? Like, what do you do with that empathy? Do you just sort of take off the headset, get back to your normal life? And that's basically what you do. But the UN's sort of introducing this idea of taking action while you're in that experience. So in the new app, they have these experiences, and they've actually tacked on a take action button. So you can actually click on that, and it instantly takes you to maybe donate your donate money, donate your time, volunteer, whatever the options might be for each social cause that they're bringing forward. And they're also now bringing it to the streets in a way. So they have this initiative in Canada where they're sort of doing home screenings for VR because obviously the refugee sort of situation is a lot more real there than, say, in the States. Um, So they're sort of trying to make people understand the refugee situation a lot better through VR, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. And it it kind of brings in this idea of grassroots efforts, which haven't been done before. yeah, and the New York Times and the United Nations have done, I, I think, really good and interesting work. But there is, I, there, there, there's something different about this circle and this sort of mm. gaming part of it. You know that, right? Um, the use of VR here, I think, um, was really interesting. Um, there were things Aaron pointed out that I don't think I had heard of before. For instance, 
there's a part in the game where um, the telephone is ringing, and even if you chose in the game to answer the phone, you can't because the phone is supposed to be on the ground next to your wheelchair, out of the field of view of your VR headset. Hmm. Um, so it, it um, you he really felt the frustration of reaching for this thing he couldn't mm, actually yeah. grab. And then at a different point in the game, um, the developers actually simulated VR sickness mm. to um, help um, simulate a panic attack that the character was having. Wow. Um, these are sort of interesting elements that make the game feel more immersive and therefore more, um, um, I guess, empathy-inducing. But... Um, I don't know if we've we've heard of that being used before. No, I think that's a really interesting sort of um, combination, right? Because you always talk about the sickness in VR, and I think that's what the developer sort of talked they about. They made it a boon here. Yeah, like yeah. he actually used it to make you feel the panic attacks, and that was amazing. Um, but I don't know. I feel like there's a lot that's happening with it and in the gaming sphere as well, but I think it'll be interesting to see if people actually start to change with it. You know, uh, I think that can only happen over a period of time to see how people actually react based on that. Um, but it's a great start. I yeah, and the 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 part you're talking about specifically, where um, it's Dana, it's one one of these like vignettes where they're trying to not uh, simulate a, a panic attack so much, I think, but. Um, the gender dysphoria show, mm. you know, this this disassociation from what she feels on the inside and what mm -hmm. she looks like on the outside. Um, and it, they they don't go into really much detail about how they do it, but Aaron, you know, talks about this like subtle weird feeling and that's, you know, it's that- It that, was intentional, it wasn't yeah. an accident. And that is one of the most powerful things that I think I've heard of. Like we, we, we've talked a lot um, I think over the last couple of months and probably a couple of years about the potential for VR to tell stories or create empathy and do all of these things and change the way we yeah. deliver narrative. And honestly, um, not that the stuff that the New York Times is doing is bad, but it seems to be very traditional in the way it delivers information, in the way it delivers a narrative. Even a lot of other VR games that you know might try to do this empathy thing. This is a uniquely virtual reality trick mm. to deliver a very uh, specific effect in the narrative that um, I really wonder what else we can do. Like, what else is there to mine? Yeah. I think they're also doing a lot with um, 3D audio in that and using that as a tool, just using sounds to create certain feelings, which sometimes even visuals mm -hmm. don't, right? So, yeah, I think they're actually playing with a lot of things within VR to sort of enhance this sort of experience of being in someone else's shoes. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where this is going. It's an interesting pr uh, progression, especially when you consider where we started with news outlets using VR. I think yeah. it's a great start to at least put people in the scene that yeah. you're talking about. But I think what we're seeing now is a justification for how VR can really add to the experience mm. in a way that other mediums, over other mediums, um, why you might experience this in VR as opposed to a tra traditional laptop game or a PC yeah, game, let's say. that's really true. I think it, yeah, you're right. I think it makes VR even necessary in certain experiences, yeah. which it wasn't earlier. And I mean, I think in general, when Engadget covers VR, we've had to think critically, um, and we've had this discussion, you and I, Terrence, we can't just put up headlines that say such and such is available in VR. We have to think critically about whether VR adds to the experience or what it adds to the experience. I can't wait for the commenters, by the way, to point out a recent headline <laughs> where we do that. It's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. But I think this is... Um, we love you guys. I think this game, The Circle, definitely um, makes the case for it. I think the UN example you gave makes a case for it. Yeah. So are, are, are people finally starting to figure out, do you think, how to use VR as a medium to tell a story? Because uh, one of the other things uh, that I always came up against in a lot of the early like sort of experiments with VR over the last couple of years, I shouldn't say early experiments with VR, but once it's kind of started to go mainstream and um, there were like branded experiences to like go along with movies and stuff and these like VR short films that sure they were interesting, uh, but it became really hard to tell a narrative 
um, visually when the creator doesn't have control over the camera angle. Right. And Mona, was it you who wrote at some point about um, how if you are in this VR experience and you can keep looking around that you yourself might be slowing down the narrative because you've just stopped to kind of sniff the roses. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but that um, I think you wrote about the challenges of keeping a narrative going. Yeah, I think people are still figuring it out. I don't think they have um, yet, which is why I think they sort of go with a companion piece for a movie because it's like somewhat of the narrative is already there for them to toy around with. Um, and honestly, it's not, I don't think people have still figured out the visuals and how it all comes together and all the other sort of tools you need to make it work. Um, because if you actually watch an experience that isn't done well, there's nothing more boring than having that headset on and having to sit through <laughs> seven minutes of like, what is going on? And you can see all the flaws in it. Um, so I think they have a long way to go, but I think they're starting to figure it out a lot better now, yeah. Is, is this sort of like, interactivity and you know game-like structure sort of essential do you think to vr as a nar as a tool for creating art and nar narratives i think they're different applications um that's that's the way i see it i think the way that journalism's using it is completely different and there's there's a strong story there and they are sort of doing a really good job of not having you know they just sort of rely on the truth of what the situation is, and they kind of let you walk through it yourself. But then there's the gaming aspect, which works really well. So I think it's sort of two different applications, for sure. I am kind of, I, I'm, I'm personally super excited, I guess is the word I'd use to play the circle. <laughs> I mean, this is, yeah. he, so this is one of the weird things um, I think I found at least about uh, VR, and I don't know if either of you ha have had the same experiences. Every time I hear about one of these like really like dark, I, and in, this is to be clear, a very dark game, mm -hmm. if we yeah. can call it that, um, experiences in VR where it puts you in the shoes of somebody else and it tries to build empathy, I'm 100% on board. I'm like, I need to do this. I want to experience this. I want to know what this is like. I have the polar opposite reaction most of the time to like when it comes to like a movie. Hmm. Like that seems really dark. Like I really have to brace myself well, for this. It's like, so wow, funny like, you should say that. And we've written about this too is is gaming as an art form is maturing and is starting to become taken more seriously yeah. the way film struggled to become taken more struggled to be taken more seriously. And I think that's why we're seeing more games and games in general, but VR experiences too, that have some sort of humanitarian or social justice bent to it. And um, I think that's why also we're more um, comfortable with these games or we've come to expect them. But it's interesting that with movies, which is the more mature art form and longstanding art form, you're like, meh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know what it is. Like, do, do you have the same draw to these experiences? I think I have it to both, uh, okay. which is why I'm actually surprised to hear that you would rather experience something darker in VR than the movies. It's, that's what you said, right? Yeah, more <laughs> or less. I mean, here, here's here, here's what I'll say is it's not that I don't want to watch the movies usually. Um, it's not like when somebody's like, this is like a really serious, dark, important film that I'm like, I don't want to watch that. I'd rather go watch insert latest Marvel mayhem here. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> um, it's more that I feel like I have to like sort of gear myself up for it more. Hmm. Um, and I think it it might partially just be the novelty of VR. Uh, that might be a big driver of it. It's just like, I want to experience mm. a, a virtual reality. Mm. This is a unique experience. Whereas watching a super depressing movie for two and a half hours on my couch is not a unique experience. That's actually really interesting. So I wonder if, if you would feel the same way when the novelty wears off. Because I think that's a pretty solid point. Like maybe that's why you're more excited about it. Um, because it's new and it feels different, right? Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I'm just as not excited, but enthusiastic to sort of experience something talk <laughs> uh, but I am I kind of go both ways with VR and film um, and you're weird for saying that yeah <laughs> Dana do you also like just dark depressing things um sometimes <laughs> this is what we established on the last episode right <laughs> is that we just we're, 
We are the Bunch dark. Dark people. Yeah, we're the yeah. dark, miserable tech podcast. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not I'm not saying you are. I'm saying the podcast in general, <laughs> largely because I play host, and I'm probably. Uh, as somebody knows, pointed you know, out to me last week, a dark, miserable human I'm being. I'm not a gamer, so, I mean, my preferences for games really are irrelevant to everyone because I'm not a gamer. But I know that as a reader and an editor, um, I prefer reading about games like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean um, they'd be my favorite to play, but um, these are the kind of... It, you know, if we're going to write thoughtfully about gaming, we should be starting with pieces, with yeah. games like this and experiences like this. Um and before we wrap up in that vein, I do. Uh, I'm I'm going to drop a link to this in the comments uh, on the description for this anyway, even though it really has nothing to do with anything. Just because I would like people to read it. Uh, Aaron also wrote an excellent piece called uh, uh, about that dragon cancer, which was a game mm. about um, losing a child to cancer. Mm -hmm. and oh yeah, it is right. one of those super dark pieces. Uh, super dark game. Super dark piece. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, gaming-oriented things that we've ever done. Um, I think it's definitely work, worth reading and looking at. Um, if, you want, if you want a game that builds empathy, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's as good a place as any to leave it. Um, Mona, where can the fine people find you on the internet? Um, just on email. I hate Twitter, so don't look for me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dana, where can they find you? Um, Mona's lying. She sometimes faves my tweets. <laughs> I do secretly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she doesn't tweet herself. She never. just faves other people's mm -hmm. tweets. Um, I am Dana Wolman on Twitter. It's my full name, no space. And um, I tweet about tech only some of the time. Mm. Just be warned. Uh, I am at Terrence O'Brien. Lots of E's, no A's. I almost never tweet about tech. Uh, most of my tweets at this moment are about politics. So if don't follow me if you're not looking to hear me <laughs> complain about Donald Trump. Um, but as always, uh, thank you guys for joining us, joining me. Thank you out there for listening and watching. Um, please send us your feedback, your comments, questions, complaints, whatever it is. We want to hear them. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Engadget or at Engadget Podcast. We have a specific podcast account, which I keep forgetting about. Uh, you can also email us at uh, podcast at Engadget. Uh, make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, your podcast app of choice. Rate us on there because the more you rate us, the more people will find us and we want people to listen to us. That's why we do this. Uh, but before I go, I want to leave you with the comment of the week, which comes from Beta Tester. Fart, the new fuel. Okay. <laughs> it's the best I got. <laughs> That's good to know. Thanks. <laughs>